Back in December, I shared a video on this PC case made from a combination of 3D printed parts and laser cut wood panels. And after that, I really wanted to try to create a custom keyboard matching the aesthetic of that case. And after a lot of playing around and testing, I was able to come up with this design. This is a 65 key custom keyboard created almost completely from scratch. The keyboard is completely hand wired and even has DIY keycap stabilizers. In this video, we're going to take a look at everything from creating custom keycaps to wiring the keyboard and programming the microcontroller. And of course, no keyboard video is complete without the sound test towards the end. This video is brought to you in collaboration with Xtool and their 4-in-1 crafting machine, the M1 Ultra. The M1 Ultra is a multifunctional machine that with the help of replaceable tool heads allow for a variety of tasks such as laser cutting, laser engraving, colorful inkjet printing on surfaces like fabric, wood and more. It also has attachments for precise pen drawing, blade cutting and can even engrave on round objects by using the rotary attachment. By using the inkjet module I was even able to create some really cool custom mouse pads which can add that little extra detail to your custom setup. If you want to learn more about the Xtool M1 Ultra and their other machines, check out their website through the link down below. Now, let's get into how we actually build this keyboard. First, I'd like to mention that all the files and instructions for this project will be made available to download for free through the link down below. All laser cut wood parts will have 3D printable alternatives available for those who don't have access to a laser. Due to different keyboard layouts in different regions of the world, most of you watching this will be required to do custom adjustments to the key map to fit your preferred layout. But in the written instructions that come with the project, you can learn more about how you can easily make those adjustments yourself. We start off the project by printing out the main body, which uses just over 100 grams of filament. Before we can start adding components, we need to remove these two custom supports. These should snap off easily with some pliers. We also want to print out our keycap set and since I wanted the keyboard to match the aesthetic of my PC case I went for the same carbon fiber PETG from Forum Futura that I used for the case to try to match some of the aesthetic of the PC case in the keycaps. The first things to install are the stabilizers for caps lock, enter and backspace, starting with the stabilizer bar which is actually 3D printed. This bar snaps into the main body and we want to make sure that the bar can pivot freely without coming out of the groove. Then we can do the same for the backspace and caps lock stabilizers ensuring that they also pivot freely. We can now install some key switches and the ones I use here are Gatoron Milky Yellows. Keep in mind this little hole on one side of the switch should always face towards the stabilizer groove. The switch will simply snap into our chassis and we can now grab our keycap and here we see three holes. One for the switch and two for these tiny stabilizer gliders that simply push into the two side holes just like shown here. These gliders will guide the keycap up and down in a track in the chassis and when we combine that with the pivot bar, the keycap will now even out the pressure by also pulling down the opposite side of where you push, just like the sway bar in your car, that keeps your car stable during sharp turns. For even smoother operation, we can also grease the pivot pins and gliders which will also result in quieter operation. After testing that everything works as it's supposed to, we're now ready to move on to add some M3 threaded inserts. These should have an outer diameter of 4.6 mm. We'll need a total of 12 inserts, 10 need to be installed from the underside, while these two should be added from the top, or the keycap side. Let's move on to the most important stabilizer, the space bar. This actually has to be made from metal, as a thin plastic rod of this length is way too flexible. But don't worry, this is super easy to make and all we need is one of these heavy duty paper clips. We want to first bend it into one long straight rod, before adding a sharp 90 degree bend to one side. We can now use that 90 degree bend as a reference on where we want to make our second bend. Basically we want to create the bend so that both sides are perfectly centered in the tracks on both sides of the spacebar. Then we want to cut them to length so the rod does not extend past the edge of this little square. Next we have this little clamping piece that I printed in grey just so it's easier to see on camera. With the little triangle facing towards the rod. These can be adjusted to fit almost any size paper clip or metal rod up to about 2mm of thickness. Every screw in this build will be M3 by 10mm. Ideally we want to apply a tiny bit of pressure while tightening the screw to make sure the rod stays securely in place. But it shouldn't be so tight that the rod doesn't pivot freely either. We can now add the switch, followed by our space bar with the gliders installed. What's important here is to make sure the pivot rod threads perfectly into the holes on both sides of the gliders before carefully wiggling it into place. If done correctly, we should now have a pretty much perfectly stabilized spacebar 
that does not wobble no matter where we apply pressure. Now, that's pretty much the complicated part of the build done. We can now move on to the fun part, installing all of our switches. And again, keep in mind that the little hole on the switch is facing toward you on every single switch you install now. When all the switches are pushed in place, we can continue with the keycaps. Keep in mind that the rectangular shape of the keycap mount only fits one way on the switch. So, if it doesn't feel like it fits, try rotating it 90 degrees. When the final keycap is in place, we now have something that looks a lot like a keyboard. It's now time to flip the keyboard over and get started with the wiring, which is surprisingly simple. Actually, the wiring diagram is printed directly on the chassis itself, and the microcontroller will sit right here. Looking at this diagram, the wiring is separated into two main parts, horizontal rows and vertical columns, that combined will form a grid that allows the microcontroller to know exactly which key is pressed based on what row crosses what column. On the chassis itself, we have a bunch of markings containing letters and numbers. Each number or letter refers to a specific pin on the Arduino Pro Micro. If we for example look at the number 9 mark, this refers to the column right above the 9, which again means that this column will be connected to pin number 9 on the microcontroller. And it's the same way for every row and column, making this process super easy to follow. Let's start with the rows, which are the horizontal lines in our grid. For the rows, we'll need about 65 diodes, ideally the type 1N4148 as shown here. A diode is an electrical component that allows electricity to flow in one direction, but blocks the signal from returning, basically allowing for one-way communication. Looking closer at the key switch, we can see that it has these two pins. And these two connect when the switch is pressed. By connecting a diode to one end of each switch, we essentially get a one-way signal out of the switch. The diode can then be connected to the next diode, and then to the next diode, until we have a full row all the way across. The switches can now all send a one-way signal into the row that cannot return through any of the switches. Then it's just a matter of doing this exact same process for all five rows and on the bottom row we can add some small wire extensions around the spacebar switch if the diode isn't long enough to reach all the way to the next one. When doing the actual wiring we can grab the diode and bend it roughly into this shape you see here. Then we can cut off the top on the red side of the diode. If we look at this little black mark this indicates which side electricity can flow out of but not return through so this black mark must be facing away from the switch. We can now solder the diode to the upper of the two pins on the switch. The ends of the diodes can then all be joined together to form a whole row. To save time, it can be helpful to pre-apply a drop of solder to all key switch pins before you start adding the diodes. As we can see now, we have our first row complete and every single diode has the black mark facing away from the pin into the row. If we now jump a little forward in time, we can now see all five rows soldered into place and we're ready to move on to the next step. It's a good idea at this point to perform a final inspection of the diodes to ensure that they're all attached properly and in the correct orientation before moving on, as it's much more difficult to spot mistakes once we move on. At this point, we can move on to our columns, which are our vertical rows. For these, we can use just about any wire, but I find it easy to just strip down a thicker wire into these tiny copper wires. These thin wires will connect to the remaining pin on each switch that are not connected to a diode. And it's super important that we wire the columns exactly as shown in the instructions for the firmware to work properly. We want to solder the copper wire to the remaining pin on each switch. Then use electrical tape or any other type of insulator to create a separating layer between the rows and the columns to avoid any shorting. We want to start at the top, working our way down switch by switch, following the wiring diagram until we have completed the whole column. Then we can cut away any excess wire. Another option is to use insulated wires and simply remove the insulation in only the spots where it attaches to the pins. This does, however, take a little bit more time but can leave us with a cleaner result. After completing a few columns, it's now starting to look pretty good and we just want to keep this going until all columns are in place. Again, it's super important that we follow this exact wiring shown in the diagram. We've now got all rows and columns wired and we're ready for the microcontroller, which is an Arduino Pro Micro. The Pro Micro drops into this little holder that can be screwed in place into the chassis with two screws. At this point, we want to start focusing on those letters and numbers printed directly on the chassis. This is actually our wiring diagram telling us exactly what row and column should be connected to what pin on the Pro Micro. For example, the column marked TX0 should be connected to the pin called TX0 on the controller. 
RX1 to RX1, column 2 to pin 2, etc. Very straightforward. The only pin that's a little different is the pin called only TX, because we have 5 rows and a total of 14 columns. We need a total of 19 digital pins on the controller for our keyboard matrix to work. But the problem is that the Pro Micro in its stock configuration only has 18, so we're lacking one usable digital pin. However, we do actually have that last pin available, it's just not clearly marked on the controller. We can actually access one more pin by sacrificing one of the built-in LEDs on the controller as this LED is not needed anyways. By carefully removing this tiny resistor with a soldering iron, we've now opened up one more digital pin that we can solder to the TX column. We can now connect our wire to the pin and solder the other end to anywhere on the TX column. It doesn't really matter where on the column we connect the wire as long as it's on the correct row, because the signal is the same no matter where you connect it. Fast forward a little bit, we can now see how these cables are connected to the microcontroller and we can for example see that column 16 connected via this orange cable to pin 16, column 10 connected via this blue cable to pin 10, and it continues like this all the way until every column is connected. And as you can see, the cable is attached at a random spot on the column as the whole column is connected to each other regardless of where the cable is attached. When we're all done with the columns, we should have something that looks like this. Also keep in mind that the color coding on the cables is completely random and has no meaning. Next, we can focus on the rows, which are our horizontal lines. As we can see here, the top row marked A3 is now connected to pin A3 just like this, to a random point on the horizontal row. The only important thing to keep in mind when connecting the horizontal rows is to connect the cable anywhere after the black spot on the diodes. Then we just repeat this for all 5 rows to their dedicated pins. We should now have something similar to this and we're ready to move on to our firmware. We start by going to a website called kbfirmware.com, which is a keyboard firmware builder tool based on the QMK keyboard firmware. On the website, we can upload the .json base file that comes with the project files. And we'll here be presented with a wiring matrix. Do not change anything here, as it's all pre-arranged to the correct configuration for this specific keyboard build. Next, we have the pins tab. And here it's also preset to all the required controller pins for the Pro Micro and should not be touched either. The tab that should be changed on the other hand is the key map. This is where we assign the function of every single one of our keys and the layout may vary from country to country so most likely you'll have to modify it to some degree. A keyboard is set up to have multiple different layers allowing one key to have multiple functions. For that we're using these function keys and I've currently placed one up here and one down here. By default, in my configuration, these will, when held down, swap the key layout to layer 3, which contains our function keys ranging from F1 to F12s up here in the numbers row. On this website, we can play around until we have the layout that works best for our use, and we can always reload the stock configuration file if we mess up things and want to restart. If we want to save a configuration, we can go to the settings tab, change the layout name and click save configuration. This is going to save a .json file that we can later upload back into the front page of this website to continue just where we left off. If we are ready to go ahead and flash the firmware onto our controller, we can go to the compile tab and click download hex. To upload the hex file to our Pro Micro, we can download a tool called QMK Toolbox. Inside the QMK Toolbox, we can open the hex file we want to upload. We can now plug in the USB cable to power up our Pro Micro. We also want to make sure we've selected the correct chip, which in this case is the Atmega 32U4. But it's still not possible to click on flash. This is because the Pro Micro by default is programmed to behave like a normal USB device and is not programmable without us telling it to lower its balls. If we look closely at the Pro Micro, we have one pin called RST and one called GND next to each other. We then want to grab a cable or wire and short these two pins by tapping once. Immediately, we're gonna see this red light light up. This means that the walls are down and our controller is now open to receiving code. If we now quickly press on flash, we should see the code being uploaded, then a message saying flash complete and the Pro Micro will switch back to its initial state of being a normal USB device, but this time with the code installed. At this point, our keyboard should function normally and if everything is done right, we should have some kind of keyboard input on every single switch. If not, recheck the wiring and key map to ensure that there are no mistakes made. If anything needs changing, we can change the firmware as many times we want until it's right.
We can now install our laser cut or 3D printed bottom panel with some M3 by 10 mm screws from the bottom. And we're now ready to move on to creating our wooden keycap tops using the Xtool M1 Ultra. To make these wooden keycaps we start by finding the best shade to engrave our letters. And by doing a test array made in Xtool software we can quickly test different shades of the engraving to compare which one works best. And since the end result will also be treated with boiled linseed oil, we need to apply that to our testing piece as well to get the best feeling of how the end result is gonna look. When it's dried, we can now clearly see what engraving settings work best for our purpose. When we have picked our favorite, I personally prefer to do a small test batch of keycaps to confirm that this is the look we want. When we apply the linseed oil, we can now see the strong contrast between the lasered area and the bare wood, which is exactly what we want in a situation like this. There's a huge difference in how the different engraving settings can affect the outcome when comparing my new keycap to my first prototype test, which is barely visible being dark on dark. We are now ready to make the full keycap set. Opening Xtool Creative Space, we can now import our cutting and engraving files, consisting of two separate files that we need to align. There's a small circle close to the center of both of these SVG files that we need to perfectly align to ensure that all symbols are perfectly centered. One file needs to be cut and the other one needs to be engraved. We can first select the cutting sketch and select our preferred material to get Xtool's recommended cutting settings for this specific material. We can then select our engraving sketch containing all the symbols and assign that to be engraved. Since we already found the perfect settings for our engraving, we can simply type in the correct values into the power and speed settings. We now have given the program two different tasks, one containing the cutting and one for the symbol engraving. It's actually really cool watching the Xtool M1 Ultra work. Before we know it, we now have a super nice and clean cut and engraved surface ready for some oil treatment to really get out those strong contrasts between the bright engravings and the dark wood tones. Once it's dried, we're now ready to install our wood tops onto the keycaps. We're going to attach them using glue, and to ensure that the glue sticks properly to the plastic, we want to gently roughen up the surface of the keycaps with some sandpaper. The glue I'm using is this Loctite Super Glue, which is a super strong and fast curing super glue, which I personally prefer for this type of task. We want to apply a tiny puddle of glue on top of each keycap, then align the wooden piece with the keycap before pushing it down into its final position. Remember, this specific glue cures very fast, so be careful to adjust the wood properly before pushing down. You can of course also use other types of glue if you prefer a more controlled approach. When we're done, we should have something looking close to this. And all that's left to do is to add this wooden frame around our keycaps to finalize the look. For those only doing 3D printing, there's also a printed version of the frame to match the printed version of the keycaps, which will be explained in the instructions. To mount our frame, we simply add a thin strip of glue around the edge of the wood before carefully aligning the wood with the printed body and pushing it down for the glue to set. And just like that, we've now got a completed custom keyboard ready for new adventures. But still, I'd like to add one more thing. Some foam pads or fabric pads to the underside of our keyboard to prevent the screw heads from scratching the desk, as well as adding some extra surface grip. With the final touch in place, we've now got this beautiful looking wooden keyboard and I'm super satisfied with how it came out. And in my opinion, it doesn't sound too bad either. For being a custom keyboard that even has custom stabilizers, I'm pretty happy with the overall feel and smoothness. I'm especially proud of the spacebar stabilizer, which came out so much better than I expected and I absolutely love the aesthetic of this keyboard together with the matching PC case. If you're interested in building this project for yourself, remember that the files are available for free through the link down below, along with custom written instructions on how to do everything from start to finish, including how to make the 3D printed wood alternatives. I also want to give a huge thanks to Xtool for sponsoring this and my previous case project by sending me their multifunctional machine, the M1 Ultra, which I'll also link to down below for those interested in learning more. Don't hesitate to let me know if you have any questions regarding this project and I'll be happy to help out the best I can. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you learned something new, and I hope to see you again in my next video.